Today's forum is sponsored by GBQ Partners, represented here by Paul Anderson and his associates. Please thank them for their support. <laughs> now that all the bugs have been worked out with me on the microphone, I'd like to welcome Paul to the stand uh, to introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Paul. I'm glad he got the bugs worked out. Thank you. GBQ Partners is proud to be a sponsor of CMC and have enjoyed our participation. We commend CMC for the variety of topics they bring forth. We are particularly pleased to be associated with this event. As accountants and financial advisors, we daily see how numbers are interpreted differently. We look forward to the insights our speakers will present today. The complete biographies for each speaker is in your forum program, so I'll only provide a brief introduction. Our speaker became Auditor of State for the State of Ohio in January 2011. After a long career in public service, working with the administration of Columbus Mayor Buck Reinhart, Governor George Voinovich, and his position as Delaware County Prosecuting Attorney. After an introduction by the Auditor, Ben Morrison, editor of the Columbus Dispatch, will pose a few questions and invite the audience to ask their own questions. Let's begin with Auditor Dave Yost. Thank you, Paul. It's a great pleasure to be here. I appreciate the contribution to our community's conversation that the Columbus Metropolitan Club brings. Uh, my first encounter with the club uh, was many, many years ago when I uh, prepared a draft of a speech uh, for then Mayor Reinhardt, who was going to address you in the mid-80s, uh, and no, he didn't use my draft. <laughs> uh, as all of you know, my office is engaged in reviewing the uh, attendance reporting practices of public school systems in Ohio. Uh, there's been a great deal of coverage over it, and rather than go through uh, all of the details of our audit work, which have been reported and in any case are somewhat dry, uh, I, I thought today, today I would uh, take just a few moments and explain why I think this is important, because there are some downstream impacts that go beyond the simple question of the integrity of the data. Uh, and uh, I suppose at a high line, I should say that we have found evidence that the integrity of the data, uh, uh, at the very least, varies widely in its quality. The obvious thing, and I'm not going to dwell on this, is the question of what, we're, what kind of message we're sending our kids. Um, I would imagine most of the people in this room uh, would agree with me that uh, there is a strong message that if grown-ups uh, are inaccurate or actually cheat, that that's not a message that we want to send to our kids. I'm not going to dwell on that. Either you get that and agree with it, or you have a different point of view and, and see things in a little more gray, uh, shades of gray. But the outcome of attendance impacts a number of things that have real-world consequences. The first is federal funding. Uh, Title I money, for example, uh, funds helps to fund a program called SES. It's a tutoring program, and it's designed uh, to help kids that are in disadvantaged circumstances that are having trouble with reading. So if you had a... a school that was getting a, a C, continuous improvement, and it was oh, their uh, performance was overstated because the data had been misreported, uh, you could very well end up with a school that really is reported as a C, but is actually in reality a D. Well, if it was actually reported accurately, those additional tutoring monies would be available to that school. The outcome is if we have a uh, system that is uh, being overreported, if you will, there are kids in that district that are already behind the eight ball. The young children in the elementary school are reading behind grade level. 
that is a stigma that if, if we don't address it, we'll follow them for the rest of their lives. It will have negative impacts all the way through school upon their career possibilities. Uh, we know that literacy is a, an important indicator of success in other areas of life. So I suspect that we probably have schools in Ohio that ought to be getting that extra money for those extra services to help those kids that are most at risk, and that money is not flowing because the data is not accurate. Another outcome is local control. Uh, Ohio is a local control jurisdiction. We uh, push a great deal of the decision making and policy making in this state down to the local boards of education. Uh, that's not the way it is in all states of the union, uh, but it is the way it is here. But that, that uh, local control is jeopardized by poor performance on the grade cards, which includes attendance as an indicator. It gets really complicated, uh, and I'm not going to go into the, into the weeds on it, but the general rule is the worse you do, the more the state and the federal government are going to tell you what you have to do. Uh, there are a list of uh, services that ought to be provided that uh, become, go from optional to mandatory depending on how poorly a school district is doing. And we have the possibility of losing students. You know, it's no, uh, it's no news to anybody in this room, I'm sure, that some school districts have had significant out-migration over the years, uh, students leaving uh, often a, a uh, urban district, uh, but there are other places as well uh, where for economic reasons or uh, socioeconomic issues uh, that there's out migration of students. That can be exacerbated by poor showing on the grade cards. And one of the consequences of a poor showing on the grade card, which again is impacted by attendance, uh, is that the, you end up in open enrollment. It becomes much easier for uh, a parent to take their child elsewhere. In addition to that, uh, vouchers may become uh, implicated and give a financial uh, pathway for students to leave the district and go somewhere else. Now, although this isn't a legal issue, we all know that this is true by virtue of our common life experience who are, the, who are the kids that are going to get pulled out? Generally, they're going to be kids that have involved parents who have a vision for their kid's future, who want them to get an education. The voucher gives them the mechanism to do that. What happens to the school that remains behind? Those performing children, those children who, have the, uh, who are achieving and have the desire to achieve that maybe could present an example get drawn out, which makes, uh, really helps to throw a district that's struggling perhaps into, into a death spiral. The uh, measurement is frequently, uh, that, that is used in, in this area is adequate yearly progress and attendance is a, a factor in calculating adequate yearly process. Uh, the Dispatch had a story this week about a man named James Beard. I'd uh, like to congratulate uh, your staff on that story. It, it uh, put a real face on this. Uh, Mr. Beard, who I had the uh, honor of speaking with last night for a few minutes by telephone, and his daughter Kaylee uh, were at a uh, urban school that may have had uh, issues with the uh, uh, with improper reporting on the attendance. And uh, he has made the investment, he had the means fortunately for his family to be able to uh, send her to a private school. Uh, if that school was overreported and should have been in academic watch instead of continuous improvement, he would have been entitled to uh, vouchers to help defray that cost. Uh, more important to his daughter, Kaylee, and this hit my heart especially because uh, my daughter played basketball. Uh, she wants to play basketball and is ineligible to do that this year because of the transfer. 
but it's little, there's little more to it than just not having extracurricular activity. Like a lot of teenagers, his daughter hit a rough spot and, and uh, had some challenges. Uh, and she began focusing uh, on a goal of playing basketball and playing well. She hadn't played before, and she would go down into the basement and dribble, practice her dribbling for hours at end. She was really focused. This was, an, uh, this was the kind of thing that helped her to push away all the external things that were troubling her and focus on a goal that she wanted to achieve. Taking a year out, uh, most of us, I imagine, in this room have or have kids. Uh, taking a year out of high school athletics is, is a big deal uh, when you're 14 or 15 years old. One year represents a substantial fraction of your life on this earth to date. Uh, when you get to be my age, a year feels like a couple of weeks, but uh, it's, we'll all remember when it was uh, young, when we were young. Look, at the end of the day, an awful lot of this is going to come down to a shaky system. Uh, I'm fully confident that our final report will find some individuals, some places that did not live up to their duty, that acted poorly. I'm also confident that we're going to report that the system is broken as it exists now. Uh, there's a lack of guidance. There is ambiguity. And frankly, the system's too complex. Let me end with a, a, a little story, and we'll take uh, Mr. Marison's questions and your questions. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a trial lawyer. Uh, now, that's not, you don't hear Republicans talking about Abraham Lincoln being a trial lawyer very often, but that's how he made his living. And he had a case where he had a particularly slippery witness on the stand uh, in front of the jury. And you know, it was one of those things where you have to ask five, qu five questions to get one yes or no answer. We've all, all known people like that, right? And so Lincoln, exacerbated, exasperated, says, tell me, sir, how many legs does a horse have? Straightened up on the stand and said, sir, everyone knows that a horse has four legs. Lincoln said, yes, yes, but what, what if we called the tail a leg? What then? How many would, legs would a horse have? And he said, well, I suppose if you call a tail a leg, it has five legs. And he turned over and looked at the jury and he said, no, a horse always has four legs. It doesn't matter what you call the tail. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. I want to make sure this is on. Is, can you hear me in the back? And we'll give uh, the auditor a chance to put his on. I'm, I'm a, if, you, if I look a little out of sorts, I was told I was going to get to interview a celebrity today, and I thought it was Will I Am. <laughs> it turns out to be David You Are. So uh, thanks for letting me participate here with you today. So how many uh, legs does a horse have? Four, unless one's been amputated. OK, just checking. <laughs> so listening to you, you, you've answered all my questions. So we really don't have any. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> but listening to you, I, can, I, I have a sense. I, I know you somewhat, because you've been in town a long time. And I've been here a relatively long time, the older I get. You seem, you seem bothered by this whole I'll use the word affair, but I don't mean it in the, in the most negative sense, this whole episode. What bothers you so much about this whole episode? Well, obviously, I've talked about some of the things. There's an impact on real lives. And, and there's a question of morality here, too, I believe. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, a great deal of my work uh, since I left the private sector and, and came back to public service has been to rationalize what government does, to try to be data-driven uh, and, and rational about what we do. You know, in government, so many times, things are done just because that's the way they've always been done. Uh, and in this instance, I'm concerned that we're undermining the whole question of a government that runs on reason and by data, because if, you know, the data programmers have a saying, garbage in, garbage out. 
if our accountability systems are suspect and the data is unreliable, then what's our basis for making decisions at all? Well, the title of your appearance here today is Making Sense of the Numbers. So as you've examined the preliminary work of your investigators, read and heard the responses from some of the districts that, whose data is being questioned, help us, the non-accountants, make sense of some of the findings. Do the changes that you've uncovered appear to be typical clerical changes? Is it that there are oversights, acts of confusion, or is it something else? Well, is it anything where you're looking at a many instances, the answers are across the board. However, we distinguished in our work on our interim report that we released last week between those things that were clerical errors or inadvertence and what appeared to be systemic evidence of uh, scrubbing, improper changing of the student's enrollment status. Uh, I want to hasten to add that we have not at this point made a determination about motive uh, so with several of the processes I've seen, there are arguably reasons to do them. That doesn't make it proper. It doesn't mean that the data is presented accurately, but it might mean that there wasn't out-and-out -out cheating. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are instances where it appears and interviews are beginning to suggest that uh, th at least some actors within some systems had malintent. So you're, you're very careful not to use the word cheating very often. It's scrubbing, scrubbing, altering, but you just use the word cheating. So in some cases there's cheating, in some cases there's not. That's your view? I think it is likely. There is evidence to support that is what I said. I'm sorry I'm a lawyer and I speak like a lawyer. <laughs> and how many, how many legs does that horse have? <laughs> So what does it mean to those of us who are not educators that a student was withdrawn, shown as having been moved, yet was immediately re-enrolled at the same school and never left? What do you call that? Uh, I call that a problem. <laughs> uh, and it has the effect, uh, we, we know that attendance is directly related to achievement. And, that's a fancy way of saying something we all know intuitively, right? If you don't go to school, you don't learn. If you don't learn, you don't do well on the tests. Uh, so the, the issue here, and I think in Marion County, what we found was a, a per se rule that if you missed f uh, four days and a quarter, uh, you're just out. What happens mathematically uh, to a certainty, uh, that correlation between attendance and achievement is strong enough that you're automatically losing some of your worst performing scores. And mathematically, that has to have the effect of raising the average of the remaining numbers. Uh, that, and that's independent of any particular methodology. That's, that's just the way the math works. One of the um, responses we heard from schools here in Central Ohio, but also elsewhere in the state was, they pointed to the fact that you know maybe this school building it got a D or an F. That that was evidence that there was no, I'll use your word, scrubbing, um, because if you're going to scrub, you would therefore end up with an A or a B, or at least a C um, grade, at least continuing improvement. What's your take on that? How do you respond to that? Well, I, I don't think it's a good argument at all. Um, and I don't think it necessarily proves anything either way. Uh, the, the essence of, of that argument is, hey, if we were going to cheat, we would have done a better job at it. Uh, and and I, I don't find it persuasive. The fact that you were unsuccessful, if you were trying to move the grade up a notch, uh, isn't evidence of the fact that you did try or that you didn't try. Uh, do you see what I mean? The, you may have tried and failed, or you may never have tried at all. So that argument doesn't make it more or less likely that the particular fact occurred. As um, most of you know, the dispatch worked on this story since, I think, June. We really got going on it. And what we were, um, I'll be blunt, we were beaten up for chasing nothing, that there was really nothing here. And then I've read 
similar comments about you know what you're doing and what you're finding that there's nothing here and you know I've never been accused of being the smartest person in the room nor will I be accused of being that here today so here's here's how I look at it so your team looked at 10 Columbus schools and found that all 10 had scrub student data we know that Columbus's own internal auditor discovered that students with perfect attendance were withdrawn that students had pending truancy cases in court had their data altered and subsequently had their cases thrown out of court and in 80 of the 81 specific cases the auditor reviewed there was no reason for why those students were withdrawn so silly me I look at that and think well there's something there how about silly you uh, it was 81 out of 82 I believe 81 but, out of 82 okay. um, he's the auditor and I trust his number <laughs> you know in our courts of law uh, the judge will instruct the jury that as you hear the evidence, it, you should wait to hear all the evidence and not uh, come to a conclusion. Uh, now, I have to confess there were times when I was in court that I thought that was pretty silly because uh, the evidence was so overwhelming. Uh, and yet, it's a valuable principle. Uh, you, we wait for the process to be finished. So uh, I'm here today as the auditor of state and uh, I have an official duty, and so I'm not going to comment on your, uh, your question today. Uh, come ask me in January. Okay. When, when might this be done? January, I'm hoping. Not till January. So I got a call from uh, an advocate of the Cleveland schools uh, last week when your interim report came out. And this person was very upset because Cleveland has a big levy on the ballot, and they were outraged that you would release this report, this interim report now, and then I said, "Well, why? So why would you introduce? Why would you release it now, when you have districts on the ballot with levies?" You know, I, I started my life as a prosecutor, or not as a prosecutor, as a reporter. Uh, I'm sure in Cleveland they think it's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at working for the E.W. Scripps Company for the Old Citizen Journal, and the, the slogan for that uh, company is give light and the people will find their own ways. I, uh, I really believe that, um, and I felt that it would be a disservice uh, to the school kids, to the parents, to the entire state if we failed to share what we knew when we knew it. You know, the corollary of Cleveland is the fact that there were many school districts that were uh, look, that we looked at in our first sample that had no evidence of scrubbing at all. Um, and some of them had levies on. Uh, so I don't see how I could not tell the truth about Cleveland and still tell the truth about these others. Uh, I'm believer in transparency and information, and uh, I think we should give the people all the information we have and let them make up their own minds. And let me add that uh, I'm a fan of uh, Frank Jackson. I think he's uh, shown some courage and, and some imagination up there and is really uh, you know, trying to make a difference. I, I don't want to affect the outcome of what's going on up there. I want the uh, people to be able to decide, um, but there are some noble and, and worthy things happening in Cleveland. How, how much does your background as a prosecutor help or hinder you in this? You know, I, it's, help, uh, it's more of my basis as a lawyer. Uh, it uh, informs the way I can approach the problem, the way I think it through, and you know, obviously there's legal implications on definitions and process. So if in January you, you get done with this investigation and you determine there was potential for criminal charges, do you, who do you take that to? Do you take it to the Attorney General? Do you take it to the county prosecutors? What's your plan? What do you, what do, you do if there are anything that's worthy of pursuit? Well, we are a reporting agency at the auditor's office. We have no independent enforcement authority. If I even do a finding for recovery in the course of a normal financial audit, I still have to go to the attorney general or to a prosecutor to actually try to recover the money. Uh, this is no different. 
the, in Ohio, the prosecution uh, function is vested in 88 county prosecutors, and the most that I could do would be to refer a case uh, to the prosecutor. We regularly do that uh, in our financial audits when we find uh, potential, potentially criminal wrongdoing. But at the end of the day, it's up to them to decide. Similarly, with ODE and the Department, the Federal Department of Education, uh, to the extent that we find anomalies in the data and the attendance reporting, uh, all I can do is recommend that they uh, recalculate the grade cards. Uh, now, I believe that uh, they've indicated that they will do that when they get that letter from me. Uh, but again, those actions are up to them. I, my office is kind of like Fox News. We report, you decide. <laughs> See, I don't, I don't even have to say anything. I can just listen to you guys. <laughs> A small number of, of districts, all urban, are saying that the problem is in the um, ODE rules and the EMIS regulations, that, that it's vague and there's some too much gray, not enough black and white in those regulations. How is it that of more than 600 districts in the state, only a few are having problems with that, that all the districts aren't saying too gray, too gray, too gray? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and as a lawyer, I look at some of the things in the EMIS regulations and scratch my head a little bit. Um, and certainly think that there could have been greater direction given by ODE. On the other hand, the fact that the vast majority of the schools do it the same way, are compliant, don't seem to have an issue, suggests to me that um, perhaps some of those that are complaining about gray are uh, like the uh, famous description of lawyers that they uh, uh, strain at gnats and swallow camels. Well. In this, in this room, most people probably care most about Columbus School District. And in the months that we've been reporting on this, this past week, the district changed its response in part on the data scrubbing, saying that the issue centers on confusion over truancy versus non-attendance and what school districts can do if a student is missing school. Does that hold water with you? Does, can a district declare a student truant or is that a legal process for us non-lawyers that has to go through the courts first? If, if Johnny or Janie, not that Janie, miss school too much, um, can they just declare the student truant, or is there a process? They absolutely do not have that authority. For, first of all, this notion that, that the label uh, on it, truancy slash non-attendance, means two different things is nonsense. That's like saying if you had a label that said, uh, OVI, OMVI, slash drunken driving, you're talking about two different things. No, you're not. It's the same thing. Uh, as a legal matter, how many lawyers do we have in here? A few? Okay. No, the rest of you aren't? Well, I see a couple that didn't raise their hands. And <laughs> That's not something most people want uh, frankly, frankly, I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is that truancy is defined in terms of non-attendance. If you go and look at the statutes, which are very densely written, uh, that's, that's what it means to be truant, is certain non-attendance patterns that are then taken to court. Now, why is that important? Why do we have to have a judge say, you're truant? Why can't the principal just say, Johnny, you're truant, you're out of here? Think about it if it was your kid. That's his school, that, that, or her school. That's where all the friends are. They're in the middle of the course of study. Do you want some guy that you've never met before no, and is accountable to nobody to just say, you're out of here? How easy would it be to get rid of people that just didn't fit in if you could do that? How easy would it be to solve your discipline problems by using the rubric of non-attendance? Now, we have those statutes for a reason. Because we need to have somebody else review it. We need to have some due process. Because where your kid goes to school and the continuity of his education matters. We're gonna, we have about five more minutes of uh, the two of us performing. And then we're going to open it up to the floor. The Metropolitan Club has a long tradition of uh, opening the floor up to questions. So if you 
have questions you'd like to ask, if you go to a microphone, because this is recorded and broadcast, that would be helpful. And I have a couple other questions before I uh, lose my microphone here, uh, Mr. Auditor. So let me figure out which ones I want to ask you. Right, here's one. How much more difficult has the work of your team been because the, the names of students aren't attached to the records? It's been tremendously difficult because the schools, not surprisingly, think about children by their names, not by 7653289947C, uh, the SSID number. The State Department of Education is not allowed to know the names of the student because of privacy law that is one of only two like it of the country. Uh, what that meant was once we found, had our uh, list of kids that had been rolled up to the state but took the test anyway and went back to the local schools, all we had was the numbers and we had to literally walk in every school building, give them a list of numbers and say, who are these kids? Then we got the list of numbers and then we said, great, can we see the files? We should have been able to walk in uh, and not force that at, at those actions. And the other thing is, ODE has a hard time doing their work not knowing what's going on. They end up having to outsource some of their data, their management information work to IBM to ask IBM to do the study and send it back to them. Uh, it's just a silly rule. That sounds like it. So if you, if you were king for a day and you could go to the legislature and sit down with the, the speaker and the Senate president and say, look, after reviewing all these issues, these are the things the legislature has to correct. What would be on your short list? I'm not prepared to answer that today. I think you should say all records should be public to the media. I think that should be first. <laughs> Can I get a witness here? There we go. OK, so that'll be a story we'll have to come back to you on then. Um, so how do you respond to people who question your motives in this? I mean, there was some, some heated commentary during the most recent state school board meeting. Um, how, how do you respond as, based on what we hear, somebody who's trying to get to the bottom of an issue and hopefully get it changed uh, legislatively if that's what it, it takes? Those people who, who question your motives, what do you say to them? Well, I try to reason with them. Uh, most of the time, that works. I understand why people get upset. Uh, you know, what's more important to us individually or to us as a society than educating our kids? I mean, not only our kids, but they're also the ones that are going to be the engine of the economy when, uh, when we're old and getting ready to pass from the scene. I, I, I get the heated emotion. For those that don't want to talk about the facts, uh, there isn't anything else I can say, but and that's okay. I'm, uh, I've been in professions starting with uh, being in the media uh, all the way through my life where I've made people unhappy. I'm just getting used to it, I guess. <laughs> Plus, I'm married. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love my wife. Once again, if anybody has any questions for the auditor, please step to the microphone. If not, I'm going to keep asking him questions, but we'd rather have your questions than mine. So uh, this is a, a you know, Ben, of... this is an unusual. I want to ask my staff, how come when I do, do a speech and ask, you know, ask for question and answer at the end, nobody ever asked me a question? They said, Dave, they're afraid you're going to keep talking. <laughs> Well, do you, uh, this is a loaded question, but that's okay. Do you think this investigation will lead to criminal charges? Too early to say. How many horse legs are on that horse? <laughs> Just kidding. The, um, so of all the things that your team has uncovered, what's the, the thing that was most outrageous to you or most surprising to you, whether it's you know, a, a district that has a certain policy or if it's records that weren't there or, I mean, there, you've got the spectrum there. What, what surprised you the most? Well, I suppose I should do the prosecu or the uh, pu public official thing and sidestep that question and answer the question I wish you'd asked. Uh, but I'll answer the question and say that I can't talk about it because we haven't reported it yet. 
Oh. Well, if everybody doesn't listen but us, could you tell us? <laughs> it sounds like there's a story to be had there. Okay. Yeah, they, I, I, I'll say at a high level, the thing that outrages me the most is that people who have the public trust think that we're stupid enough that they can just say anything and that we're going to buy it. Why does that outrage me? Because we the people are the, are, the, are the bosses here. They're supposed to work for us. And they have, I shouldn't say they and us, but you know, folks in public service only have one real asset. It's the credibility of what they say. Once you sacrifice that, as Richard Nixon found out, you lose your ability to govern. And when you've got a, a, a generic school system that might be facing difficulties, and you squander the public trust by providing inaccurate, misleading information, you have just doubled or tripled the odds that you're going to be able to find your way out of those challenges to a better tomorrow. Uh, I'm very worried at a, a macro level. I look around the world, look at what's happening in Spain, I look what's happening in Greece, and I think that one of the challenges we're going to really have that we had left behind us a long time ago uh, in America is the notion of ungovernability. Uh, sacrificing trust and credibility by misinformation is the first step down that road. Uh, please, your name and then your question. Uh, hi, my name is Peter McCray. Um, I heard, I think, you talk about one ramification of attendance records being scrubbed or changed and that having to do with federal funding. And I, and I believe that's the only one I heard. I have a feeling from some of the articles that I've read in the dispatch that there's a whole bunch of other ramifications to data rigging, whatever you want to call it, uh, in the schools. I mean, are teacher evaluations on the line? Are bonuses on the line? Are um, Oh my goodness, I don't, I, I, so I don't know, but I have a feeling that there's a lot more ramifications to this issue than the one that I heard you say, and you may have said more. Can you please elaborate and, and just be straight up and tell us what some of the ramifications are to the changing of the data that you've uncovered? Uh, and then secondly, is this only an Ohio problem or is this something that is nationwide, other states? Have you heard of other instances like this? Thank you for the question. Uh, great questions, Peter. Uh, there are other uh, ramifications. You raised bonuses. 5% of the t federal Title I money uh, is available to be used for a teacher incentive fund to uh, uh, produce, uh, provide bonuses for achievement. Uh, you know, that, that could be an issue that might motivate somebody. I don't know that it necessarily uh, would rise to the level of an impact. Uh, but another issue is that the State Department of Education uses adequate yearly progress and, and uh, some of the attendant, or excuse me, some of the achievement markers uh, to determine how they distribute federal funding among the, the, the uh, school districts. Uh, so it's conceivable that, but for uh, problems with the data, that money would have flowed differently among the districts. It's also possible, we're talking with the federal government about this right now, uh, because we perform the A133, uh, the single audits of, of schools uh, and federal compliance on the major programs. It's possible that uh, some schools could end up needing to restate their uh, financial statements. The federal government could, uh, or the state government, could elect to uh, try to claw back or recover money that was inappropriately awarded. I don't know that any of those things are going to happen, Peter, but they're, they're possible. Well, what's the second question? Other states? Oh, question? other states. Um, there have been, uh, there's at least one state out west that had uh, some issues here, and I don't recall where it was. It was not a statewide systemic issue, it was, as I recall, um, 
Obviously, Georgia went through a scandal uh, on the testing side of the thing, of, uh, but uh, again, uh, adults not playing by the rules to try to change the outcome. And uh, so I, I think the, based on the interest that I'm seeing from the Department of Education at the federal level in our work, I, I think they're kind of wondering uh, the same question, whether this might be occurring in other places. Jane? Well, thank you, first of all. It's a very important topic. We're not always used to having such weighty topics at the Metropolitan Club, and I know there's a risk for both of you for being here, so thank you. Ben, I have a question for you. Oh, you no, know, just, you can only ask ah, that. I think that's a great idea. You no, know, I set the rules in this room. <laughs> Look at the time. Look at the time. Um, I paid know, for this microphone. <laughs> you know, there is... Uh, there's a lot to be said about credibility for public officials, but certainly the Columbus Dispatch has a great deal of credibility, and I know you don't, you and the publishers don't take that lightly at all. Talk about the scene in the editorial room or the newsroom when you begin to uncover something like this and you go, oh my gosh, when, what do you do? I mean, how do you all feel because these are your kids and this is your community and this is your state too. I'm just curious about what happens behind the scene a little bit when you're having to cover a story like this. Well, the, uh, that's a very good question. It, we, the first thing we do is we, we tell the reporters, prove it, and then prove it again, and then keep proving it because what we, what we cannot do is write a series of articles about something this important and then have somebody like the auditor come out and say, you're wrong. And to date, he's never said that. And that's our goal, and our expectation is he will not say that. But it's, a, it's, it's really your torn, because on one hand, we, pursue, we want to pursue stories that are important, that um, we want to shine the light of day on problems. And this is a big one, from what we can tell. But these are, these are kids' lives. These are well-intentioned administrators and principals. And we understand the stakes here. We, don't, we never go into anything lightly. We look at it. We try to put as much scrutiny on our work as we are on everybody else's. Because we know in this day and age, everybody is going to apply that scrutiny. And that's fair. So there's... And you get excited when you have a good story, but you're torn because it's, a, it's not a good story. Does that make sense? Um, it's one of the um, mixed blessings of being a journalist. You know, you, you want to find these stories so that they can be fixed. But then you understand that, you know, sometimes that, that shadow gets cast on people that did nothing wrong and, or are part of a, a district, whether it's here or elsewhere, that, um, they had no no knowledge of it or no no investment in it. So it's it's a good question. I'm glad you asked it, despite what I said earlier. But um, it's, I'm sure it's the same thing for people like the, like David here. That the goal is to get at the bottom and fix it, so nothing, so it can be fixed. I don't know if we have nobody else standing, so I don't know if our time is done or we have one more. Okay, we'll take one more question and then we'll get everybody back to work. Ann Loader. Um, Mr. Marison alluded to kind of being stonewalled on getting some information. Has your office run into that with any of the districts or because you're the state auditor, do they have to be forthcoming? I know you mentioned, you know, matching numbers and names and all that type of thing, but, you know, when you walked into the districts, were they all, here's the information you need or did you have to keep coming back? A great question and uh, let me correct a uh, apparently it disabuse you of a notion. Uh, the fact that I'm state auditor, it gets like nothing. We still have to say pretty please. Uh, the, we, we've run into roadblocks, but I don't believe they were intentional roadblocks. We, uh, I, the Department of Education at the state level has been uh, endeavored to be uh, cooperative in every way. Uh, some of the local districts, it's been a little more varied. But they're also often in a very scarce resource environment. Uh, so if we hand them a stack or, or ask for 300 student files, 
they may not have anybody left on staff that uh, is able to go pull those. Uh, and so you end up with some delays and, and whatnot. But I don't think anyone's stonewalling us. The most frustrating thing in terms of the delay, other than just the complication of the thing, every time you uh, look at it, fact, I'm reminded of the Dave Crosby song, uh, uh, Anything You Want to Know. Uh, there's a line that says, beneath the surface of the mud, there's more mud here. But uh, the, the most frustrating thing is probably where uh, lawyers are reviewing for privilege uh, documents that we've requested. And uh, that process can be pretty slow. Hi there, Scott Gerber. I had a question. You mentioned the Atlanta situation earlier. Does this, how do you think this compares to Atlanta? And if it is as significant, why is it receiving national coverage? Well, it's much colder here. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know uh, that it's not receiving similar coverage. Uh, it's probably a little bit more arcane, isn't it, than uh, the, the, vi the vision of people t uh, taking pencils and erasing the dots off the tests and filling them in right. It's a little more visceral, I think, maybe easier to imagine than dry discussions about statistics and grade cards and uh, performance measures. Uh, that would be my guess. I don't know, maybe you, you're in the media. Why do you think, uh, how come AP isn't running every story you have? Well, there actually has been, there's been quite a bit of uh, pickup on this story nationally, but I think for the reason the auditor cited, this, this one's difficult to understand unless you're gonna spend some time thinking about it. And if it's not your school district, not your kids, you, you're not going to invest that much gray matter to trying to figure this thing out. You do ask the question that uh, was asked earlier, is this happening here? And I think that's why the, the feds are interested in the outcome of his audit. I'd like to thank you both for your time here with us at the CMC. I hope you enjoyed today's forum. In fact, you can see it again. Share it with others on YouTube, which is a link from the CMC website. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please remember to make reservations for our forum next week, Ohio Issue Number 2, sponsored by CMC's political series reporter, the Jeffrey Company, Ohio Farms Bureau Foundation, and Hannah News Service. And I want to invite you all to continue this conversation over coffee and cookies out in our lobby. You might have noticed that you have a new name to badge. We are trying to recycle them, so please throw them in the basket as you uh, leave. Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors for today, GBQ, and our speakers, David Yost and Ben Marison. Thank you all, and have a great day. <laughs>